Hey guys, thanks for clicking on this video and checking out my channel. Hopefully this can be of some use to some of you guys that were like me. This video is going to be dedicated to this guy right here. This is my Sony FX6. I've had this camera, I don't know, a month or two now, a couple months. I've used it on some jobs, but I've tried to make this video about this camera probably three times now, and I've gone through recording it, and I'll tell you what I did this time. This time, I made notes. So hopefully we can, we can kind of get this through. And my whole point of this video is just things that like, if you were like me, and you were switching from like previously using hybrid cameras, and the FX6 is your first legit cinema camera, or video camera, if you will, you know, some things that you might not know about it, or things that I haven't seen in a lot of other videos, or I have seen them in there, but they're kind of like glossed over in these other videos because a lot of the other channels that are making videos about this FX6, it's not their first rodeo with a cinema camera or a high-end video camera. So I think they kind of pass over things that are, they seem obvious to them, but they're not obvious to someone uh, like me or you. I just wanted to, to talk about a few different things and how they affect how the camera operates. Hopefully you'll find it useful. But before we go any further, let me just tell you a little about me. I'm the Tactical Traveler, just a straight shooter who tells it like it is. All the gear that I review on my channel, I've either purchased with my own money or I've rented it with my own money. Occasionally, some smaller companies will send me little pieces of gear to try here and there, and I'll, I'll completely disclose that. However, I don't take money from companies to do reviews, and I don't use affiliate links, which is really the most important part. So I'm not gonna try and sell you on clicking a link down below so you can buy something that you really don't need just because I get a little cut of the purchase. That's that's the little secret. So everything that I talk about on my channel, stuff that I actually use or I can, I've tried to use and it either might have been a fail. Anyways, let's get back on with the video about the FX6. Let me start by saying that this is an amazing camera and we're filming on the FX3 right now. So I have an FX3, an FX6, and an A7S III. And a lot of people would say, well, they're all the same camera. And that's just not true. Now, you can make an argument that the FX3 and the A7S III, I'd say the image is pretty much the same between those two cameras. Ergonomics is a big difference in there and how they operate as a as more video focused versus more like hybrid focused. But that's a whole nother video. I've made videos talking about what I like about the FX3. I'll put a little link up here. You can check that out. But the FX6, I feel like that, this camera is a completely different beast. It is not the exact same. I was I was on a job with this last weekend and we were talking about it and he had an A7S III there, three, and we were talking, he's like, that's yeah, pretty much the same image. Well, it kind of is and it isn't. It does have the same sensor, but I feel like the processing behind the image is different. I mean, I, I'm not gonna put side-by-side -side images on here because that's not the point of this video, but they're different. It's just a little different. I think Sony sprinkled a little something in there extra to me. To me, I feel like it is. Right now, the FX3 and the A7S III, there's an argument there that they're pretty much the same camera and I really wouldn't argue with that. It they pretty much are. We just it's a matter of what's more important to you, video focus or or a hybrid camera. And you know, if the extra that you get on top with the uh, XLR cable is is XLR handle, I mean, is nice. But anyways, what one of the things that that I learned when I got this. Let's just let's check off our list number 1. All right. Everybody talks about 180 degree shutter rule. Super important. If you're watching this video, you're considering FX6, you know about that. I'm not going to waste your time on it. But if this is your first camera that truly has shutter angle, how does that make a difference in how it operates? Well, the difference is if you're coming from a hybrid camera and you're shooting in, let's just say 24 frames a second on the FX3 right now, my shutter is set at one over 50th. If I wanna to switch to 60 frames a second, I have to switch my shutter to one over 120 and so on, right? With this bad boy right here, if you put the 180 degree shutter angle, when you switch frame rates, the shutter switches automatically. So that's just kind of a nice thing that you don't have to remember to do. So that's just one of the things that makes it a little bit different operating it. You set your 180 degree shutter angle, 180, and it just does it for you automatically. So you don't have to, to switch the shutter ever, really. I just leave it on 180. If I have a creative choice that I want a, a different angle in the shutter for like more of a, a frenetic look or a little bit more motion and trails, we can do that. But for the most part, it's on 180. And you never really mess with the shutter again, which kind of goes into some of the other stuff we're going to talk about here. Let's get to number two. Number two. Number one is done. This is a serious one. This is something to think about. Everything, when you get one of these cameras, is more expensive for us. The batteries cost a whole lot more money. The cages cost more money. The cables cost more money. 
everything costs more money. You want a shoulder rig for it, you want an EVF for it. Everything costs more, the media, the cards. I mean, if you, you're not really, I wouldn't use less than a V90 card in here. Most people are using those on an A7S III now, but if you're coming from like an old A7S III where you could pretty much use anything to this, media is way more expensive. Batteries, you know, batteries for the Sony uh, Z batteries that are in like the FX3 and the A7S III, what are they? The Sony branded ones are, I don't know, $79 a piece. Batteries for this guy, I buy the um, the Core Power Nano 98 with a little, has a little uh, D-tap in it. Those are over $200 each for just a single battery, $200 per battery. So everything gets more expensive is my number two that you probably need to think about. Well, we're just moving right along. This is not going to be the Odyssey that the other video was that I was trying to make this in the past. This is a big one. This is the big one I wanted to get to. I alluded to it earlier. We're talking about shutter angle. So... When you expose traditionally on other cameras, or hybrid cameras, not other cameras, when you expose on any other hybrid camera, and it goes for this camera too, but you normally, you have your shutter. Well, we talked about it. It's got a 180 degree shutter angle. You set that and you set it and forget it. Then you have your aperture, and then you have your ISO. Those are the three parts of the exposure triangle. If you're on this video, you know that already. How is this different with exposing? Well, when you're in the Cine EI mode, which is Cine EI, that stands for exposure index, there's only two ISOs. And I see so many of the Facebook groups, people are like, oh, I can't change the ISO, 800 is, is too bright, I'm outside, or, or it's not bright enough, but 12,000 is too bright. So when you're in Cine EI mode, it has two ISOs, 800 and 12,800. There's not 1,600, there's not 6,400, there's not 100. That doesn't exist in Cine EI mode. There's no other picture profiles, it's just S-Log. So you're just shooting an S-Log 3, that's it. And then you have... 800 or 12,800, low or high base ISO. So if you want to change your exposure, you're not messing with your shutter, you've got two choices for ISO. So the only other option is to open or close your aperture. But what makes this camera so amazing is that built-in ND, which if you're watching this video, this probably isn't the first video you found on it, you're aware. I use the ND a lot for exposing with this camera. So what I do sometimes is I will actually, and this is something I never really did, I never messed with the exposure compensation dial on the top of my A7S III or even my A7 III. With this one, sometimes I use the exposure compensation. So let's say I'm shooting at something that's a little bit backlit and it's reading with the ND, the auto ND I might have on, and I'm seeing that it's it's sort of, it's too dark, it's not lighting the subject enough. So I can just sort of use the, the uh, exposure meter there and just do plus one, plus one, whatever, minus one if it's too bright. And I can kind of get the, and what that does is it ends up adding or losing ND. Or you can manually control the ND and how much ND you want to do if you don't want to use auto ND. That's really your only options for changing the exposure. That's the biggest thing. And I see so many people confused when they get this camera, not being able to figure out how to expose with it. It's so easy to expose with once you get that figured out and the exposure tools that are built into this camera are so good. Watch Alistair Chapman's videos. They're long, but if you are buying one of these cameras, watch his videos on how to do the exposure and how you can set the two zebras and create lines on your waveform that will show you where like white should be, where skin tone should be. You can put a couple, it gets long. That's how this video ends up getting too long when I talk about that. Cine EI mode, you put your two zebra lines, you use your waveform. It is a breeze to expose, and I have got such great looking images out of this camera. It almost is like cheating. It's so good. So the other thing about Cine EI mode that, that I think confuses people, it's that exposure index. So with exposure index, what you're doing is when you're looking at your screen on this camera, you look at the little screen here on the side of the camera and it shows you an image and you can basically put like a monitoring LUT on here. So it's recording S-Log, but you can put a LUT that's just to help you monitor. So you'll see it in like a Rec. 709 color space. If your image is too bright, I think some people get confused and they change the exposure index by moving it up or down. That's not changing your exposure. That's simply changing the monitoring LUT, how bright or dark it is on the screen. This is, again, an Alistair Chapman thing. You should definitely watch his videos. He goes in really in-depth in these things, but basically, and this is what you kind of had to wrap my head around, if it's too bright, you would think, bring the exposure index down, so now it looks darker. Well, it's going to look too dark, so now I'm going to open my aperture up a little bit to get just that right spot. I maybe bring the exposure index down. I'm like, oh, that's a little too dark. I'll just open the aperture back up. 
Well, what I'm actually doing is that exposure index was just the LUT got darker. So by opening my aperture on the, the image was already too bright. I thought I lowered it. Now I'm opening the aperture. I'm actually overexposing it even more because the images didn't really change when I lowered the exposure index. It's like so hard to wrap your head around this, but I think once you kind of figure it out and get it, you'll understand how exposure index works. It, it's counterintuitive to what you think. So if you're in a darker environment, you lower your exposure index to, to then force you to overexpose. And if you're in brighter environments, you raise the exposure index to make you underexpose. Kind of crazy and kind of weird how it works, but just basically watch Alistair Chapman's exposure index and how he talks about how exposing with his camera. He's much smarter than I am and explains it a lot better. But then the other option you have is custom mode, which kind of, again, is a little counterintuitive and sounds weird. Custom sounds like different than Cine EI, like custom's what I want to be in, but custom mode allows you to shoot in the f Cinetone profile, which is what I'm using right now on the FX3. I love this picture profile. I don't even color grade, don't touch anything. If there's a little exposure tweaks, I can mess with those, but I don't mess with any of the other colors. This is what you get out of the camera. If you're in custom mode, you use s Cinetone, or you could bake in one of your own LUTs if you wanted to load them into the camera. Or there is kind of a workaround where you can shoot an S-Log by just basically having no LUT on it when you're shooting an S-Log 3. Then that gives you that full control. It acts more like a hybrid camera in custom mode. You can have the ISO 100, 200, 300, all the way up and down, just, just like your, your A7S 3 Now, I don't think when you, when you shoot an S-Log in custom mode you're, and you're using all those variable different ISOs, you're not really getting the maximum dynamic range out of the camera or the, the best quality. And I know dynamic range sometimes is overblown and unnecessary like measurements, but like the cleanest best image is gonna be at 800 and gonna be at 12,800 with this camera when you're in S-Log. And I think that's another thing that I've learned since I've been shooting on, on a, a proper video camera. You know, you're outside in the bright sun, you're like, I don't wanna shoot at 800. I will just put it in custom mode and shoot down in, in 100. Well, believe it or not, you're actually gonna make your highlights clip and you're gonna create all kind of issues when you do that. You're better off shooting in 800. And, and if you look at some of the charts that they have that show like how many stops at dynamic range above and below you get, you'll find that like your middle spot where you have the most latitude in highlights, which is again, hard to get your brain wrapped around it, and the most latitude in shadows will be at like 800 or 12,800. That gives you the most distance above and below you know, your midpoint, your middle gray. So I suggest figuring out, if you're gonna get this camera, figuring out how to work it and use the Cine EI mode. I use s Cinetone if I'm in custom mode, and that's just for quick turnaround stuff. It still looks amazing. You're gonna get phenomenal looking images out of that, but if you wanna get the absolute best image quality possible and you wanna have that contri the creative control in post-production for color grading and stuff, you gotta use Cine EI mode. But I just wanted to tell you a few things from my perspective, sort of a layman's perspective, the guy who's first camera using this that is a little bit of a learning curve, and hopefully I explain those things in a way that made it easier to understand for a beginner. I try to explain it like me, because I think a lot of the big guys that, that have gotten this camera, they just kind of gloss over those things, and they don't, they don't really explain them, like dumb it down, I guess, for a guy like me. Is, I mean, not saying you're dumb, but I'm kind of dumb. And, I needed to dumb it down. I mean, that's just, it is what it is. Hopefully I've made this video not as ridiculously long as the other two times I've shot it and maybe I'll actually publish this one. If I do, thank you for watching it and making it this far. Don't forget to subscribe down below. It helps me out a lot because I don't do affiliate links, like I said, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.